morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where the theme of today's episodes, for the stories only, I couldn't get a, uh, a straight flush in terms of a theme here, but anyway, for the three stories of the day, the theme is skewed stories in the industry trades or the media overall. Like, I like what they're covering, but I think the conclusion that they've drawn uh, or where they're trying to lead the reader is incorrect. So... I'm going to try and course correct. All right, and I'm very curious to hear what you think, uh, what, your, what your opinion is on um, uh, where these stories stand. All right, so the first one was this big story in The Hollywood Reporter over the weekend about the Rogue One salaries, what everybody got paid to be in the movie. Felicity Jones got a lot more than her male counterparts. In fact, she got in the million dollar, somewhere in the million dollar range with seven figures, whereas they said nobody else in the film got over a mid-six-figure mid salary. Uh, and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, Felicity Jones, she, and the exact quote was, she knows her worth. And I felt, and they were trying to use this as an instance of women fighting for a better salary. Now, that's happening right now, Jennifer Lawrence and Passengers, although that backfired a bit, but it's happening very effectively in television. I don't know if you've heard of Robin Wright, uh, negotiating for equal pay with Kevin Spacey on House of Cards, saying she saw the stats and her character at some points was more popular than uh, Kevin Spacey's during the last season. So she really, uh, nego you know, she really fought hard for equal pay. And so did Emmy Rossum on, um, um, ooh, sh uh, Shameless on Showtime. She fought for equal pay with, <clears throat> with uh, William H. Macy. Now that seems a little weird to me because William H. Macy is, I think, of a different caliber. But based on the comments that I was seeing uh, on that article with her salary negotiations, the fans really like her on that show. So within the world of the show, for Showtime, and Shameless is apparently very successful for them, she's extremely valuable. So good for her. So those are two instances of women fighting and getting equal pay. But I don't think this is a win for women in the salary department with Felicity Jones for a number of reasons. First off, she is the star of the film, and there's no male... There's no male role of equal caliber where you can say, well, why aren't they the same? I, I think people sometimes, you know, dilute the conversation and, and um, you know, put it in, in, a, in a bad light when they're like, well, all actors should be paid the same. I mean, it's based on the size of your role and who's the star of the movie. Like, for instance, when the, 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 the discussion was really heated uh, last year, Jessica Chastain was like, can you believe that Matt Damon got paid more for me than The Martian? And I'm like, yes, I can, as he's the star of the film, and you have, like, only a handful of scenes and lines. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, we don't want to go, we don't want to make Hollywood socialist, we're just trying to make it fair. So I think that, of course, Felicity Jones would get a higher salary than everybody else in the film. And I think particularly considering that at one point uh, she had a much bigger, different role, but it had to be, you know, vastly changed in the rewrites. And there is something that's interesting. She put people so off in the trailers that they had to cut many of those lines and change her and drastically alter her role in the movie. You know, she actually ended up being a bit of a hindrance to it, uh, I believe, and I think there's enough evidence to make that claim. But she yet get the, got the most money. And so I think that the, her worth comment is a very dangerous comment to say, uh, you know, that she knows her worth. I think she knew her negotiating standpoint was that she just came out of uh, being an Oscar-nominated actress uh, you know, for the theory of everything and her management team, her agent and her manager, and, you know, the, she might have even more people representing her, a lawyer. Uh, they went in there to Disney and they said, you know, you have this Oscar caliber name. You're able to say Oscar uh, nominee, although they never did. You know, you got to pay for that. You got to pay for that if you want that. Uh, and, and, you know, to their, to Felicity Jones's team's credit, Disney did pay. I mean, at some point, the studios are going to have to be like, you know what, I'm not doing it. Uh, but they're, they're on a little bit of a trend right now of getting uh, awards, winners, or nominees into franchise filmmaking. It's this new trend where you get gold or you almost get gold and you go and you get a franchise. Uh, Eddie Redmayne, Fantastic Beasts. Brie Larson, of course, is the new, uh, you, know, you know, the very first Captain Marvel. And Alicia Vikander is the new, uh, Emma, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lara Croft. So... We'll see how this works. I think that Betty Redmayne didn't do much to help Fantastic Beasts box office, and I think maybe after like a year, a couple of years, a couple of movies come out, Hollywood will realize they're not getting their money's worth. But, you know, at the moment, this is a great time for actors who win or are nominated for awards to make some really nice money. 
Uh, and I do really honestly feel that uh, Felicity Jones hurt the movie, so I'm glad she got her paycheck. Uh, and I think that Amelia Clark could end up being a hindrance to the Han Solo movie because it's the exact same thing. You know, just as people didn't like seeing Daisy Ridley go to Felicity Jones, I think when you put Amelia Clark on that, you know, on that um, in that lineup, it's just gonna I think be a little bit even more off-putting. And I hope she's not another saucy, spunky character, right? I mean, it's like they are down, they're the same down to the personality. So I think that that's a, pro a problem, and I, I don't like it being represented as women fighting for better salaries, right? I just, I think the whole thing's a little bit of a mess, and I think the real story here is that Disney overpaid. Disney overpaid for Felicity Jones, and as many of you have pointed out, they could have gotten a new actress, because in this case, the brand is is bigger. And it's interesting, you know, uh, Marvel got Chris Evans, they got Chris Hemsworth, and it's worked out really pretty well for them. Uh, I think they got Mark Ruffalo on the cheap too because his career was not doing well when he uh, signed on to be the Hulk uh, for the first time. And so uh, I don't see why they're not trying to do the same, th save, sa do the same thing as saving money with actresses. Uh, although Redmayne, of course, is in this conversation. Uh, so anyway, there's something else interesting. This is a bit of a spoiler for those of you who haven't seen Rogue One. So if you haven't seen Rogue One, you might want to skip to the next story there. Chapter times, as always, in the video description. I'll give you a moment so I don't have a spoiler here. Mm, still here? Okay, so the other interesting thing to come out of this article was that uh, everybody else who signed for the movie was explained to them that this would be the only time their character would ever appear, right? Like, sorry, thank you. Maybe there's something in there for like doing voiceover for video games or, or animation or whatever, but no more movies. Except for Felicity Jones, who is optioned for one sequel, which I thought was very interesting. And it made me feel, you know, maybe they want to have her show up like in a prequel, but I think that even more likely, maybe in the original movie, before Tony Gilroy came on and reworked this whole thing, maybe Jen Erso survived. And the fact that the woman, the only woman on the team would be the one to survive where all the guys died, I'm glad they changed it. Uh, so interesting, I thought that was really interesting and another perhaps very telling thing about the behind the scenes situation with the movie. All right, like your character was so grating that she had to be killed. All right, so anyway, let's go to the second story of the day. And, and the story here is that there was also another big article uh, Hollywood Reporter again. Uh, no, no, this was this was Deadline. Okay, Deadline wrote this article, uh, and I was really surprised about this. Deadline said, "Oh, Collateral Beauty succumbs to schoolyard taunts from critics. Like they were just so mean, they just tore Collateral Beauty down." I'm like, I didn't see any of you defending Batman v Superman uh, when that happened, right? Like, you know, if Collateral Beauty. Oh, suddenly Rotten Tomatoes needs a slap on the wrist, right? I think this is just, you know, I think maybe some damage control being done by Deadline for Warner Brothers. I don't know if Warner Brothers asked for it, if maybe they have a good relationship or the producers of Collateral Beauty do with Deadline, and they decided to try and stop the bleeding if they could, because it's really hemorrhaging for Collateral Beauty at the box office. So they were like, oh, you know, like today Rotten Tomatoes it has like a, cons a, 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 a lemming mentality, which I think to some degree is true. And it does talk in the article about, uh, you know, sometimes the, edit the editors at, at different magazines and newspapers and outlets will be upset if a reviewer differs from the mass opinion. Uh, and so that's another thing to make people not do it, critics not do it. But I mean, we all know to take critic scores with a grain of salt, right? I think that while sometimes critics might act as lemmings, I don't think that audiences do. And I think, so they said, oh, you know, um, the critics were unfair to this movie, and then audiences just ran from it. Well, let's, let's first of all, let's be honest about a couple of things. First of all, bad Rotten Tomato scores didn't keep people from supporting Tarzan, The Legend of Tarzan. That movie did surprisingly well despite very low Rotten Tomato score. People went and saw that film. Uh, very much so, in fact. And also, how about the entire slate of DCEU movies this year, where Rotten Tomatoes could not derail them? And I think that, to be honest, the reason nobody saw if you, I'd be curious, why didn't you see Collateral Beauty? Please write your thoughts down below. Uh, was it the Rotten Tomato score? I mean, from what I'm seeing from a lot of the comments online and in response to this article, people were like, the trailers looked horrible and the Rotten Tomato score only solidified what I already suspected about the movie, right? Also, Will Smith, I think he has very little trust from audiences these days. People are movie stars like Tom Hanks because, you know, and even he has uh, waned a little bit, I think lost a little bit of trust because he's made some clunkers. But you know, usually you're a movie star because audiences have faith that if you've picked a movie to be in, it'll be good, right? You're, like, you're, you're, you're a guaranteed result on their investment. And that's why someone's a movie star usually. And so I think Will Smith has had a lot of bad films that he's delivered, and I think audiences just simply don't trust him anymore. As I pointed out to you on Movie Math, the 
opening for Collateral Beauty was right in line, and as we'll discuss today, later today, it's right in line with other films that Will Smith has made like this. So why is suddenly Rotten Tomatoes to blame? Also, they're saying, oh, you know what, maybe we'll put the cinema score uh, rating up there. Because, you know, everyone just sees the Rotten Tomatoes score, but cinema score was an A for Collateral Beauty, or like an A minus. So we should have that up there. That'll really help the movies. But here's the difference the cinema score comes from people who went to see the movie voluntarily and paid for it. It's the general public being um, polled as they leave the theater. You know, they do random polling across the country. But those are people who wanted to see the movie and paid for it. So, of course, they're more predisposed to liking it. I don't think that's as, uh, as a good a score as, you know, I think Rotten Tomatoes, I have my own problems with it, as we've discussed, but at least, you know, that's a group of people who went to the movie because they had to, right? And so you get a wide range of people. Uh, I don't, you know, you could argue about how many differing kinds of people are really movie critics, uh, but anyway... You know, it's, it's, that's why critics, it's, that number is going to be more trusted than the cinema score number. It's like when I used to do audience reviews, right? And they would always be pretty high unless the movie just was horrible. And that's, you know, the score from the audience. And that's because you were talking to people. I was interviewing people who went to the movie like at 10 or 9 a.m. the day it opened and paid for it. And, you know, got up and got to the theater to see it first thing. So, of course, they're more likely to, to like the film than dislike it. Uh, also, you know, what's really hurting, I continue to feel this way, what's really hurting movies at the box office is television, that's just, just so good, and there's so much great stuff you can watch at home, but also cell phones. I think that cell phones, if I had to point to one thing that were a problem in theaters, because they've always been kind of dirty, right? It would be cell phones. Because people are just out of control. And until movie theaters do something to curtail this, like Alamo Draft House, which will kick you out for being on your cell phone, they're just going to continue to lose support. Like, for instance, when I went to see La La Land um, on uh, Saturday, actually, in New Jersey, through the whole trailers, this woman was t messaging people on her phone. She was just texting them. And she was in the, it was like stadium seating, and she was in the front row, so everybody could see her. She lit up the whole bottom corner of the frickin' theater, and, you know, it was just the trailers, so nobody could really say anything to her, and nobody did. And thankfully, she put it away when the movie started. But it was really crummy and disrespectful to everybody else in the theater you, who, you know what, maybe wanted to watch the trailers. She wasn't there by herself. Someone was with her. She could have easily gone outside and done that texting, and then come back in and just sat back in her seat, which the person was saving for her it was just absolutely just so incredibly rude and really kind of made me upset uh and that is i think the experience that people want to are looking to avoid and why there's are starting to be some really legitimate um advancements being made and bringing movies to you at home as soon as possible all right so that's the second story of the day i'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on that now the third story of the day is that Denzel Washington was in 60 Minutes on Sunday talking about fences and they decided to ask him about Oscar So White and he was very, very curt about it. Uh, as Denzel Washington often is, very difficult interviewee. He's, uh, I think he's like, I don't have to play this game anymore. I'm a mega star. And it's like, mm, you know, I think you gotta be a little more agreeable. But anyway, um, oh, I had my own bad experience with Denzel Washington. It was on the uh, red carpet uh, for Flight, I believe, during the New York Film Festival. And uh, everybody had, to, I'll just tell you the story really quick so you can know where I'm coming from. And, you know, uh, he'd, he'd done a first couple of, like, TV interviews, and then he got to the rest of the carpet, and they were like, okay, we're going to group you. And that's when they group everybody on the red carpet. And so I was, I really was aggressive, and I got my question in first, you know, because you know, sometimes there's only one question that's asked. And he just would not, he just stood there silently and his wife had to answer the question. And it's like, you know, Denzel, you could have said you weren't doing any more interviews. You could have just not walked the red carpet, but come on, you know, could you, I, you know, it was a very respectful question. You know, it's not like he, you know, he's like trying to like, you know, he's like, oh, well, I don't want to answer that. It was just, you know, I don't know what was going on. It was very weird. All right. So anyway, <laughs> Denzel, but I love his work. I think he's very talented. I can't wait to see Fences. But anyway, they asked him about Oscar So White, and he said, look, I've lived it. Uh, and he said, like, something kind of convoluted where he was like, oh, you know, I've been there when I, when I, you know, they've called my name, when I thought they were going to, everyone thought they were going to call my name, but they didn't, and I've been there when they haven't nominated me. He's like, you know what, yeah, it's tough. What are you going to do, give up? Just keep trying. And I think that on, 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 on one hand, I agree with saying, you know, just because a situation is hard or perhaps not fair doesn't mean you should just give up. I mean, the only thing you really can do is just keep going. But I think you, I think you can speak up, though. Um, and I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm very curious how you guys feel about it. I know that Will Smith has come under a lot of fire for not being supportive of the black community in Hollywood, uh, you know, really only being supportive of it and feeling he's a member of it when it's convenient or he needs it. And I think that I wonder how people feel about Denzel Washington not willing to support the Oscars So White 
movement, uh, you know, from, from all different groups, how you guys feel about that. Uh, but I think that it is, the reason I think it's important to speak up uh, is because, for, for instance, look at how much uh, the Asian community has benefited from George Takei's comments at last year's award season when Chris Rock made an unfortunate joke about Asians and, uh, you know, math and accounting and used ch Asian children to do it, no less. George Takei hit him really hard, and you have seen a huge change in the number of uh, Asian talent in front of him behind the camera since then. I mean, it's just been an explosion. And that's all thanks to George Takei. So I think that that was, you know, he spoke up. He, he, and he did so, I think, in a respectful but, a, you know, aggressive, like, this is a problem manner. And he got results. You know, women, women need to uh, speak up. But right now, they just also need the work. I mean, women need to get the jobs in the first place before they even talk about whether or not they're getting awards. And also, women right now are fighting for equal pay very hard, as we've, as we've just discussed. Uh, but then, as for black talent, you know, the, the issue that Denzel Washington was asked to address, they have the work. Uh, black talent has gotten past that hurdle. I mean, I'm not saying that it's all a cakewalk, but, you know, they get really great roles. They ha they're behind the camera making exciting movies like Moonlight. Now they want the recognition, right? So it's like, okay, we, got, we've, we, got, we won that battle, on to the next, right? Uh, and so I'm, I'm just wondering what you think of Denzel Washington's stance here, and do you think it will hurt him in this category? Uh, he's, of course, probably going to be nominated for Best Actor, but he's not getting any nomination. You know, the picture, it's not getting really Best Picture, Director. And I, I suspect maybe, you know, sometimes this kind of an attitude can be a factor there. You know, uh, and, he's, and he's already also won twice. So I think it would have to be really an amazing performance to, to give him uh, a third Oscar. All right, and also there have to be very weak competition, and that's certainly not the case this year. So those are the three stories of the day. Now, the viewer question comes from Mark Slepper, and Mark Slepper says, viewer question, Grace, why do you think studios seem to push digital media for the home movie market so much at the cost of physical media? What he means is telling you to download the movie and buy a digital version of it, which can exist in the cloud, versus going and buying a physical copy. Like, for instance, Suicide Squad had a month early digital release and then only recently came out as a physical copy. So Mark says, uh, oh yes, thanks for your videos. I love your insight into Hollywood business and try to watch your videos as much as po possible. Greetings from the Netherlands. Hello, Mark. Oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you so much. And I think that's a really interesting question. And I brought it up, not only to answer it, but I wanted to highlight how this very issue is really also responsible for reshaping the film industry as we know it. So Hollywood would love for you to buy physical copies of uh, their movies. That would be their ideal scenario, but people don't buy them anymore. So that's one of the reasons that they don't push it because there's not a market for it. There are some collectors for sure, which is why they still do make them available, but it's, it's dying out. And someday you probably won't be able to get a physical copy or it'll be very hard, just like you can't, really can't get physical copies of um, you know, music anymore. So they're really pushing digital. Now they're having problems with digital because one of the reasons that people used to buy physical copies of movies was because they wanted to be able to watch it whenever they whenever they wanted to, right? It was very hard, you know, it was difficult. To, sometimes the, uh, the, the blockbuster would be out, right? Or you couldn't get your hands on it or, you know, you don't want to like go and travel, you know, you, maybe you want to watch it at the last minute and you want to have it available to you. So people would build up movie collections. But now because of digital, um, the, uh, like stuff like, um, iTunes and Amazon, you can get a movie at any time you want immediately and you can just rent it. You don't have to pay $20 to get it. So you can get that movie for just $4 or maybe like six or seven if it's a new release or, you know, if it's almost kind of, it's like one of those early releases. But anyway, uh, you know, and also so you don't feel a need to, you don't have a burning desire for many people, like the casual moviegoer, to, to own a film because you can get it whenever you want. And the truth is then sometimes you get distracted because there's so much good TV now too. You don't need to go rewatch old movies. You can watch uh, something new on TV. It's part of uh, a subscription that you already have. So, you know, that saves you even more money. I think that's one of the reasons that Apple will make a movie available to you early on iTunes, but only if you buy it to really make sure you don't pay the $5 rental fee because they try and get that 20 bucks from you. And that works. I bought a lot of movies that I didn't plan to buy because I got all excited about watching it. And then I was like, only for purchase. Oh, well, I planned my whole evening around it I guess I'm gonna own uh, you know uh, I, I like um, I don't remember it was like it was um you know the guy from The Unknown? He was in some movie about a soldier with, in Ireland, and I was like, okay, we purchased it. And so it was funny. All right. It was a pretty good movie, but I, not one I would certainly have bought. But anyway, uh, so the reason is that they want you to purchase these movies is because this was a huge revenue, revenue stream for Hollywood. Many times, whole movies for 
for theatrical release could be funded from a film's physical sales of physical copies of that movie or you know it would be the reason to make a sequel it was just so popular on streaming so that that's like a really big uh that was a really big revenue stream for hollywood and that's why they're trying so hard to get it back and the digital is just smaller it's not like ever, the same money just went digital but people buy less they only rent as i just said and so it's just less money coming in and that was probably one of hollywood's biggest revenue streams in fact uh, because so many more people want to watch at home than in the theater. So that's why they're pushing to do this uh, two-week window where just two weeks later you can get it for like $50. I mean, they would love for you to pay $50 for a movie, right? Uh, they'll take even a little bit of a hit if you invite everybody you know over, right? They just really want to get that revenue stream going again. So that's the answer, Mark. They, they push uh, digital because that's what people want these days. It's very hard to sell a physical copy and the, and the thing they're worried about is that they really need that revenue stream and they're trying to get it back. So I hope that was uh, helpful to you, Mark. I hope it's, you're having a great day or evening in the ne Netherlands. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories. Mark's viewer question, do you buy physical or digital copies? How has is, how is the digital revolution changed how you purchase and consume films uh, on the go or at home? Uh, and then, of course, write down below anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.